Good, mo good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends on where you are uh, following us from uh, today. Um, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. And this is the Atlantic Council's Iraq Initiative event. Uh, we are uh, honored to uh, host His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Republic of Iraq to Washington, uh, Dr. Farid Yassin whom I will introduce in a second. But before that, uh, uh, we would uh, like to wish everyone a, a Ramadan Mubarak and to remind uh, everyone that this is a, an on-record uh, uh, conversation. Feel free to uh, tweet the, uh, what, what you uh, hear from His Excellency and also uh, to uh, use the information uh, that uh, is being presented uh, on the record. Uh, and uh, I would like also to thank uh, our uh, communications department at the Atlantic Council and the uh, Iraq Initiatives team, especially uh, my colleague and co uh, associate director, uh, Mr. Masoud Mustajabi, for his effort on this, and the embassy's staff uh, for making this uh, event possible. Um, his uh, Excellency Ambassador Farid Yassin is in no need of introduction, but I am going to just uh, present a few highlights from his uh, long and impressive um, biography. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Yassin has been uh, in his post in Washington since uh, 2016. And uh, before that, he was Iraq's uh, ambassador uh, to France. Um, he uh, joined uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in 2004, uh, and he served in uh, the uh, uh, all important department of the uh, uh, Ministry's Department of uh, Policy Planning. Uh, uh, in my visits to, to the Ministry, uh, this is one of the places that where all of the, the, the great things are being done, and he was one of the uh, not just the, the um, uh, directors or the, the heads of this department, but he also was one of the founders of the work there. Uh, everybody still remembers his days and what he accomplished there. Uh, Ambassador Yassin uh, was educated uh, in Iraq, um, in Switzerland and in the US. Uh, uh, he is an MIT graduate. Uh, he's a physicist by, uh, by uh, academic training. He is a scholar who served in uh, uh, research capacities in various universities in Europe and in the, uh, in the United States. He also presented a valuable consultation to many uh, organizations and entities, including and particularly uh, the uh, Secretariat of UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, and uh, I could go on, but uh, uh, the, uh, I would like to reserve the time to uh, hearing from the ambassador on many issues uh, that we are having. Uh, and especially uh, Iraq right now is passing through an interesting period of both accomplishments and challenges as well. Uh, part of it is particular to Iraq. Some of it are part of uh, the, the worldwide challenges that we have under uh, COVID and, and other uh, economic uh, issues. And we will let the ambassador elaborate on, on Iraq's position and all of this. Uh, without further ado, um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Abbas. Um, I wanna thank the Atlantic Council uh, for this opportunity. Um, it's always good to talk about Iraq after it, events take place. I um, also want to address my best wishes uh, for a happy Ramadan to all those who are celebrating, even those who don't, because I mean, Ramadan is a bit like Christmas. It's a spirit of giving and sharing. And so I hope we all benefit from that. So um, thank you again for inviting me. Um, last week, uh, the Iraqi and American delegations met virtually uh, to uh, uh, hold a new session of the strategic dialogue established in accordance with, and I'll mention the full name, the Strategic Framework Agreement for Relationship of Friendship and Cooperation between the United States of America and the, and the Republic of Iraq. Um, it's a mouthful, but it says what it means. 
And the interesting thing about this session uh, is that not only that it was held uh, virtually, but it was headed by uh, both ministers, so Secretary Lincoln and uh, Minister Fouad Hussein, uh, and also included participation uh, from uh, representatives of other uh, agencies, uh, the White House, Brett McGurk, uh, Defense Department, Mark Carlin. On the Iraqi side, we had uh, uh, Mohammed Beati, John Mohammed Beati, who was the Prime Minister's military advisor, as well as the National Security Advisor, uh, Qasem Naraji, in addition to the minister. And then uh, we got into the nitty gritty of things with the uh, two deputy foreign ministers, uh, David Hale on the one side and uh, Sorry, on Secretary Hale on one side, and the on the, the other we had um, my good friend uh, Nazar uh, Al Khairallah, uh, who uh, is a longtime uh, uh, holder of that position and what somebody who really understands how the Iraqi state functions. Uh, he's uh, participated in many intergovernmental sessions, um, and uh, so this uh, event took place. And I think the reason why the uh, in contrast to the previous session that took the virtual session that took place in uh, in April last year, uh, there was an intent to broaden the uh, participation to other agencies. Was to convey from the outset that the that there is all government involvement in this dialogue, both on the Iraqi side and the uh, and the United States. Um, at the end of the uh, state at the at the session, um, the uh, both parties issued a. Uh, 1200 uh, word joint statement that addressed the usual topics, security, economic cooperation, culture, et cetera, and two new topics, uh, COVID and the climate emergency, uh, with even a reference to the climate accord. Um, in Iraq, the, there was much focus devoted to the part that addressed the presence of US troops in Iraq. There were of course dissonant voices, but overall the statement was, was well received uh, overall. Now, uh, I was uh, part of the Iraqi team in the negotiations of the SFA and its sister document, the Status of Forces Agreement uh, back in 2008. So perhaps it would be helpful if I gave the audience a bit of background on how these uh, two documents emerged. And this was 12 years ago. Um, the driver even then from an Iraqi perspective was to have a Status of Forces Agreement. This issue was first raised by the Iraqi side in 2004. Um, when Iraq was still under the uh, CPA, that's a coalition provisional authority, and the Opera Security Council Resolution 1483 that recognized the responsibilities under the, of the occupying powers under applicable international law. It also set the stage for the return of authority to Iraq by recognizing the Transitional Governing Council. Uh, Sergio Bello, uh, may he rest in peace, had a big hand in, in doing this. Iraqi uh, authority was then recognized by Security Council Resolution 1546, which also put the coalition forces, dubbed multinational force, under the authority of the Security Council, acting under Chapter 7. But the resolution also gave the Iraqi authorities to the ability to request the termination of the mandate of the multinational force. The issue of the SOFA came up again in 2007 from the Iraqi side in its effort to strengthen its sovereignty and claims thereon, and from the United States side as the administration sought to provide the incoming administration with an orderly transition. The negotiations were not easy. Uh, for example, uh, the US from the outset had envisioned an overarching framework in which to which you could attach specific uh, uh, targeted uh, agreements so that if, re if required, you would just get the congressional approval that is necessary just for that purpose. The Iraqi side viewed, viewed things differently, and at any, at any rate, both agreements were signed in 2008, the SOFA and the SFA, uh, uh, I think uh, voted on in, in November of 2008, and then signed uh, and turned to force by uh, presidential decree uh, in December. Uh, the SOFA called for the departure of US troops by December 31st, 2011, they left. In 2014, when ISIS came up, came out, a whole new legal mechanism was cobbled together to allow for the US to come back to Iraq uh, to provide us with assistance in the defeat of ISIS. We are grateful that they did. The SFA, on the other hand, does not have a sunset clause. Uh, so for the first next minutes, let me discuss it and look at how we have sought to implement it over the past few years. 
It's a rel relatively short document, about eight pages in total in the English version, with a preamble describing the context and 11 operative sections, which I will list. Uh, a section devoted to principles, four topical sections dealing with polit political and economic and di diplomatic cooperation, defense and security cooperation, cultural cooperation, economy and the all important energy sector, health and the environment, and uh, a new, new thing for us, which is the information technology and communications. And then there is one uh, final operative, um, uh, sorry, a topical uh, 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 section having to do with uh, law enforcement uh, and judiciary cooperation. And then we have three uh, sections devoted to uh, the process of the uh, of the uh, of the agreement, uh, a joint committee implementation, and the final arrangements. The longest and most detailed of these sections is on the economy. The main point of the SFA is that it is broad in its scope and general in its language. It can be applied as widely or as restrictively as desired by the parties. This is why in 2014, when we were all caught up in the drive to defeat ISIS, uh, there was a com almost complete focus on nothing but the security components. Um, and I have to add that its inclusion of language on security, and namely, uh, I'll, I'll read out the two, the two, the two sections uh, in question, that the temporary presence of the U.S. forces in Iraq is at the request and invitation of the sovereign government of Iraq, and with full respect for the sovereignty of Iraq, and that the United States shall not use Iraqi land, sea, or air as a launching or transit point for attacks against other countries, nor seek a request or request permanent bases or permanent military presence in Iraq. This was actually very helpful in relaunching the process in the spring of last year and was reflected in the, in the final statement uh, issued by both sides after the virtual session. Um, a few months later, uh, this was followed by an in-person meeting in August last year in parallel with Prime Minister Kadmi's meeting at the White House. And then just a few weeks, just, just, just last week by a virtual session headed by both ministers and with the participation of the uh, entities that I mentioned earlier. The statements issued showed a broadening of the process. Last April, uh, the statement consisted of some 600 words. Last August, uh, they came up to about 900. Last week, uh, the total was about 1,200. So a doubling of the, of the statement and the, therefore of the issues that have been covered. Um, let's look at the statement. Um, and it's available for you to, to peruse. It reaffirmed basic principles. It discussed cooperation to address current crises, COVID, the economy, power in the energy sector, including the need to focus on capturing flared gas and to better integrate into the regional uh, electricity infrastructure. Uh, it also addressed the protection of freedom of expression and the promotion of the rule of law. And quite importantly, uh, this is something that we may want to return to later, support for the forthcoming elections. It also dealt with cooperation on the military issues, including uh, the temporary presence of US support and training troops in Iraq. There was also, and that's an important point, recognition of the progress achieved by Iraqi forces. Iraq recognized at the same time, the contributions of the United States and the coalition in supporting Iraq against ISIS and improving the capabilities of Iraqi forces. It also reiterated its commitment to the protection of coalition personnel and of foreign embassies. That there is a greater focus over the last two sessions on the economy is an indication that we are approaching, if you will, a normalization, which I, I sense also uh, in the United States with moves uh, on, on the Hill to um, you know, uh, go beyond uh, the almost 20 year old uh, AUMF. So there's a need to, or a feeling that we should try to move beyond security. And one indication of that, uh, that's something that could not have happened earlier, is the focus on the environment and on climate change. That is a new dimension to our cooperation uh, to address an issue that I actually believe is an, is an existential one for the countries of the region. We were also able to acknowledge important milestones achieved recently, one, ones that would facilitate further cooperation. Uh, 
the possibility to, to obtain visas on arrival for citizens of 30 plus countries, including the United States, and the approval by Iraq of the New York Convention on Commercial Disputes. There has not been a state set for the next meeting. I hope that it is held soon enough and that the joint statement will acknowledge further milestones. Uh, for example, the opening of an Iraqi consulate in Houston and the reopening of the US consulate in Basra. Um, to this, I would like to draw your attention to the picture behind me, which shows, um, which was taken in Basra in, I think, 1938 or 1937. And it shows um, um, uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, on a pit stop, uh, a refueling stop in Basra um, on his way to, to India. And on the picture, there is a, a representative of the American consulate to Basra at the time. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, your uh, sense of Iraqi history and also the history of the relations is uh, remarkable and absolutely indispensable uh, for, for people like me. I always uh, enjoy uh, your, your reflections on uh, these uh, relations and, and how they developed, how, where they were and where they are now and where they are going. Uh, I will pick from what you just uh, stated and, and a couple of things that are probably on everyone's mind. Uh, much anticipation was made inside Iraq and out of Iraq as well on this uh, dialogue uh, and, and the uh, what language that would come out of the uh, communique and out of the meetings about the status of forces. Um, the uh, Previous uh, communique did mention a uh, some form of redeployment or withdrawal uh, reduction of troops. And now I must mention that all three, uh, uh, even though they happened under two different administrations, two under the Trump administration and one under the Biden administration, my impression from talking to people participating in them is that they were all cordial. So uh, both administrations, there was a positive atmosphere between the Iraqi government and the American government in both cases. Uh, so uh, many people were waiting to see what would change on the status of forces from the outcome of the uh, dialogue with the Trump administration and what uh, the outcome uh, from, from talking to the Biden administration. Now we know that the Biden administration put a little bit of a postponement on any planning until they review the status of forces of US forces, not just in Iraq, but in many regions. So what is new and what is the latest on, on that, uh, on, on the status of forces that came out of this dialogue and going forward? Well, uh, thank you for pointing this out, uh, Abbas. This is a critical issue and it's been uh, discussed at length in Iraq and it was one of the items that uh, uh, was debated back and forth uh, in the drafting of the, uh, of, of the statement and you can, you can imagine how carefully the language was chosen. Uh, so the, the fact is that, uh, the, uh, there that the statement recognizes that, that ha there has been significant change since uh, the last time that now uh, there are uh, practically no US combat forces in Iraq. They've been all been withdrawn, uh, I think last year, um, that the uh, focus of the activities of American and coalition troops in Iraq is to uh, essentially assist us in the fight against ISIS, uh, more specifically in, in training, in equipping, in providing us with information um, uh, and, and you know, so-called ISR uh, cap capabilities. Um, and in, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, the number of American troops in Iraq has, been, uh, has never been so low. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that combined with the, uh, with the great progress achieved by the Iraqi forces in terms of their readiness, in terms of their increased capacities, uh, we can contemplate, uh, I don't know how soon, hopefully soon enough, uh, a day where they'll be entirely uh, capable of uh, taking care of our situation, of our security situation on, on their own and being a force uh, for the stability of the region. You, you mentioned in, in your statement a minute ago uh, that there have been uh, or has been an interest in uh, a well-rounded implementation of the 2008 agreement, especially 
the um, the strategic framework agreement, which is still operative uh, between the two countries. Uh, one of the uh, uh, critiques, uh, if we don't say, um, you know, criticisms of of the the how this document has served uh, is that it is lopsided in favor of the um, uh, security uh, aspect of it. And as you just articulated earlier correctly, that it is just one of these aspects uh, dealt with security. There are various other uh, areas the document includes. Also uh, that, that uh, there has been an interest in maybe on the business side as well, but not much was given to, uh, or not much attention was given or implementation on the aspects of uh, non-security and non non-economic side, especially the cultural side, education, technology transfer, um, many other issues that are important for the Iraqis' cultural side. Uh, there are there are certain sectors in Iraq where the United States, with all of its advanced uh, knowledge and expertise can really bring a lot of good to Iraq. Now, um, uh, I know that there are myths and realities about how people view this, the, the implementation of the strategic framework agreement. What is the actual status or actual story uh, that you know it from an, uh, the inside of, of the relations between the two countries and what actually is being done on the ground versus what is known or what is per, uh, the, the perception is? Well, my take on this is that if we want a, uh, and the operative word here is engagement, if we want a 360 full-fledged engagement of the United States with Iraq, we cannot do it without, without the private sector. The private sector is, in fact, the standard bearer, a bearer a carrier of the United States uh, anywhere in the world. It's not that I want to see, uh, you know, McDonald's or, or, or Starbucks or any other uh, sector. I'm actually satisfied, you know, with, with Iraqi food. Not that I dislike the uh, the products that I that I just mentioned, uh, but we would like to see, uh, you know, Iraq becoming a, uh, you know, a, a, a country where American companies set up cooperations, joint joint ventures. We have some of that with in the oil sector, but I think it would be really useful for us if we can broaden this to the critical areas uh, for Iraq, uh, water preservation, for example, um, climate change uh, is one of, the, one of the issues that I mentioned often. And the point that I raised to all of my friends uh, here in the United States is that because the United States is the only major industrial country that has areas where you find the same kind of climate that you would find in Iraq, then your companies are probably better equipped to help us address uh, this trans energy transition than companies from other countries that do not have uh, the kind of weather that uh, that that we uh, we enjoy and sometimes have to endure um, there is also a, a sustained effort in terms of educational cooperation um, as you may know there is now a third uh, american university in baghdad uh, in iraq set up in baghdad uh, ironically in one of saddam's old palaces I haven't visited it, but I'm, I'm eager to do that. Um, and then there, there are ongoing uh, cooperation programs. The real difficulty has been in fostering the exchanges, the meetings that can, that can uh, foster further cooperation. Uh, the visa was one uh, restrictions was, was one, one constraint, security situation is another. But as, as things improve, people will travel back and forth and meet. And in fact, one of the um, positive uh, developments of this uh, pandemic, and as much as there is one, is that now what we're doing right now is something that uh, that spans borders, and so where 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 distance doesn't really matter. And so we can try to set up uh, meetings between Iraqi businessmen and American businessmen uh, to uh, that would have not have been that would not have been possible earlier because of the restrictions on travel. Um, I'm actually pretty positive on this. I mean, other areas where we really need to cooperate um, are critical aspects for Iraq, for example, agriculture. Uh, I know that uh, I've spoken to a number of uh, congressmen who have uh, highlighted to me the uh, great capabilities of their agricultural companies in their districts. And once this, uh, this uh, hopefully this uh, uh, pandemic eases off and we're, we're able to travel, I'll try to go and find out for myself to see whether we can promote 
more, more such cooperation. Uh, there is uh, one specific mention, and I owe this uh, to uh, the former Minister of uh, edu Higher Education, uh, Jose Sahel, who, when he came here, uh, when we were talking about having him visit the United States, and I said, I'll try to set you up with uh, visits to major universities. He said, no, what I want to visit, first of all, is NOAA. Uh, NOAA is, I think, one of these agencies that not a lot of people know about, but it is e incredibly important. It's the uh, equil equivalent of NASA, if you will. NASA sends up you know, satellites and they go look upwards. NOAA sends up satellites and they look downwards. And that's what we need. Uh, we need uh, the assistance in the United States uh, in order for us to be able to know where we stand with regard to our natural resources, with regard to our climate, with regard to our water situation. Um, uh, that will help us achieve better management and better and to protect uh, these resources as best we can and to confront the crisis of climate change. And this is reflected in the, uh, in the statement. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned the visas. Uh, to, to my knowledge or my, my understanding, this was what, what was negotiated or, or agreed to was a diplomatic visas uh, facilitation. Am I right? That's uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are two things. So first of all, there is there's a rule that uh, now allows uh, people from the United States to go to Iraq and ask for a visa on arrival, and they'll okay. pay a, a simple fee, and, and that and that'll en enable them to to stay for a couple of months. Um, you know, people are, are trying to uh, capitalize on this in, in as many ways as you can. For example, I know somebody who's thinking of trying to organize. You know, papal tours. So taking tourists to go and do, um, to follow the steps of uh, His Holiness John uh, uh, Pope Francis in Iraq. Um, and uh, I, I, th I yeah, of course, um, these are visiting to uh, visiting visas. You won't be able to, you know, pick up a job or anything like that. There, there are other restrictions, but uh, it is it is a great move forward. Now. Uh, do we uh, expect to see some reciprocity here for Iraqis coming to the United States? I must note your great effort and successful, uh, great really effort to, to get Iraq off the, uh, the, the uh, ban list that came in the beginning of the Trump administration. And Iraq was originally on, on the, that ban and then um, you were instrumental in, in getting Iraq off with many other uh, uh, support from from many others uh, that that you enlisted, uh, but still I believe that uh, Iraqis' ability to come to the United States is an issue. Also coupled with that, if I may ask as well, uh, the the issue of um, uh, traveling to uh, Iraq from the United States. I mean, as an Iraqi uh, American, there are of course a, a, a there's a great number of Iraqi Americans here who visit Iraq, and it's a nightmare to go. You have to go through it a third country or maybe a couple of other countries before you go to Iraq. Sometimes it involves an overnight. It's really a, a project to, to try to travel to Iraq. Also, is it possible that we could hope one day that there would be a direct flight from the United States to Baghdad or to other cities in Iraq where people could just go and make their life easier? And that also fits within the idea of facilitating business or mutual uh, uh, businesses to go to go back and forth and and it will help a lot at least easing the logistics of, of their relations business relations and tourist relations well as you know I'm, I'm interested in in old travel I collect old travel posters and uh, uh, Baghdad and Basra more more importantly was really a, a regional hub for international travel. Um, and in fact, my, my father once told me that he sat next to John Kenneth Galbraith on a trip from Baghdad to New York, which uh, Ambassador Galbraith took on his way back from his ambassadorship to, uh, to India. So all the planes that used to go to India, to, uh, to Australia, used to stop in Iraq. Um, I don't know if we'll, we'll, we'll recover that. This role now has been picked up by, by uh, uh, cities in, in the Gulf with, um, you know, and that's something we have, we thank our, <laughs> our regime for. Um, uh, it's a real loss. But this is something that we are working on. It's difficult because uh, on the Iraqi side, because uh, of certain legal 
uh, restrictions imposed on, on Iraqi airways that they're trying, that they're working hard to resolve. Uh, but I would very much like to see uh, a US flag carrier at the very least uh, do this as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, there is a process for this and we've, tried, we've asked for it to, to be initiated. But uh, I mean, I, I, uh, tr trust me, I would really like to have a direct flight from, uh, from Washington DC to, uh, to Baghdad. We hope and, and are fully supporting your, your uh, effort on this, and we, we hope to see it sometime soon, because um, uh, Iraq receives flights from all over the, uh, the, the region, at least, and from beyond, and you yeah. know, there, it's Mind always you. a smooth travel to Iraq. It, you know, the airports are friendly and really easy in and out. If, if I could, if I could add just one one point, I, I think uh, beyond the fact that there is uh, uh, that uh, the business interest uh, and the diplomatic interest uh, would uh, make this a commercially viable line, uh, don't forget that we have an increasing number of Iraqi expatriates in the United States now. I think um, I looked at the. Uh, I'm actually eager to to look at the new results of the new census. Uh, but the last census in 2000 carried out in 2010, if you extrapolate it to 2016, the number of Iraqi natives in the United States exceeded 250,000. So if you added to that, um, you know, second generation, third generation, you're probably well above a million, uh, maybe two. So it, 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 I mean, I'm addressing this to. Uh, um, you know, airline companies, I think you'll find if you can get a lock on that route, uh, you'll be making um, a good return on investment. Wonderful. Uh, going back to the to the uh, dialogue, um, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, one of, one of the observations that I and many others have made uh, in writing about it uh, was that uh, in the previous communique, the cultural side uh, received an anemic paragraph of one line. Uh, I'm glad to see that now we have a full healthy paragraph on the cultural side uh, of, of the cooperation between the two countries. And, and uh, there are a few issues that are very important, not just the help and, and expertise and, and support the US can give to, to Iraq, but also there is this major issue of Iraqi antiquities and Iraqi national heritage. I know that uh, uh, you have worked out a repatriation of the Iraqi archive. Uh, uh, or some of it, and there is also um, I, the, the uh, thousands of, uh, if not more than thousands of, of uh, uh, artifacts uh, that, that are in the United States. Some of it even there are, they have been brought and they are certifiably either stolen or smuggled out of Iraq. Some of them are even in US custody. Uh, how are you going about this and what are your anticipations about what will happen to it, especially some of these are, you know, there, there, are, there are some probably legal issues around them and uh, those who hold them still seem to be holding them tight and they are supposed to be returned to Iraq. Um, actually, this is one area where cooperation is going very, very smoothly. And I have to commend uh, and be, express my gratitude to uh, US authorities on this. Uh, they've been really stellar and and on 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 the uh, on the cutting edge of this. I mean, I can I can refer you to what happened two or three years ago when three thousand eight hundred pieces were returned to us because a uh, you know a, a worthy officer just noticed the discrepancy and saw that this was uh, that these were smuggled artifacts and so they were returned there. They're somewhere secure. <laughs> we haven't been able to uh, ship them back to Iraq. Uh, as yet, but uh, but we have them. We have them securely. Uh, others who have been, uh, you know, involved in the exports of uh, illegal export of uh, of Iraqi antiquities are making amends and and trying to help us uh, recover all those artifacts that uh, that are in their possession that they've ceded um, uh, to us uh, completely uh, legally. Um, so we're, there there are there are a few you know technical issues that we need to resolve. But I mean, I think. Uh, fairly soon, we'll we'll see the re repatriation of uh, you know thousands, maybe tens of ten thousand pieces back to Iraq. There are uh, other legacy issues that we're dealing with uh, uh, that have uh, that are in the custody of uh, major U.S. universities. I'm talking about uh, artifacts that go back you know decades, uh, but this is a, a an ongoing process, and uh, you know they will return. The wonderful thing about, about uh, archaeological artifacts 
is that they don't lose value with time. Oh, yes, I totally agree. Uh, now, uh, le let me uh, move on to a few issues that are not specifically US Iraq relations, but uh, Iraqi domestic uh, developments. So recently, we have seen some activity, and of course, they are on the mind of everyone. Iraq watchers are interested as well, uh, and then want to make sure that the trajectory is maintained in the positive direction. Uh, the, the parliament just had a few accomplishments uh, this uh, recent uh, month. Uh, and, and since then, uh, we've seen a couple of important votes. One of them is the vote to uh, uh, pass a budget, which is, I will ask you about in a second. Uh, uh, 2020 didn't have a budget, and now we have a budget where uh, allocations are actually made by law rather than going on continued resolutions month to month based on the 2019 budget. Uh, and, and money needs to be spent in Iraq you know, and, and to meet some of these urgent needs uh, that, that Iraq has and challenges faces. The other thing was the uh, elections where the parliament re removed two important impediments before the uh, the the uh, uh, snap elections that are planned for October 10, 2021. Uh, and uh, whether we agree that the elections, the snap election is needed, it's a good idea, but definitely because it is on the agenda, it's important that the Iraqi parliament uh, solve the issue of the Supreme Court that is supposed to certify uh, the elections. It's not the Supreme Court that the constitution calls for, but there is a Supreme Court now that can go to a uh, while the actual law is being worked out and also uh, dissolving the parliament uh, that will happen on the 10th uh, or the, the 7th of October if the uh, government is ready to have the election by by the 10th and President Saleh just uh, uh, issued a decree calling for an election on that day so all of the constitutional arrangements were done so my first question was uh, is on the uh, on the elections how is the government uh, going to go about um, preparing for the elections and what are the, uh, the hopes and, and the preparations for holding the election on the set time and also an election that is uh, fair and, and, and that is transparent as a Prime Minister Academy has promised and it seems to be the planning going that way. Well, um, so, um... Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back, but, uh, you know, Iraq is one of the very few countries in the region who's had uh, on uh, elections um, at every um, uh, constitutionally mandated period for the last uh, over more than 15 years. Uh, that's not nothing. Um, and um, I think we've developed uh, a pretty good expertise uh, in Iraq. I tell people that Iraq has expertise in what might be construed as two completely different areas. One is in counterterrorism, you know, special forces, and also in, in uh, uh, electoral issues. Um, and so we do have an uh, independent higher, higher electoral commission. Uh, they're working hard on preparing the elections. There have been drawbacks. Uh, I think one of the major drawbacks of the last election is that the uh, turnout was very, very low. Uh, and so um, with all that implies, um, and so uh, I think the uh, main objective of the Iraqi government, and this is something that has been translated to its uh, diplomats serving overseas, is that we need to make sure that there is a high rate of participation in the elections which means convincing people that these are credible elections, which means uh, trying to run them in the most professional way, but also uh, trying to bring in, uh, uh, you know, as many uh, observers, uh, impartial, uh, maybe foreign observers as, as possible. And so that's what, we, what we've been engaged in. I know that if you read the, the uh, statement uh, of the uh, uh, strategic dialogue, uh, the United States acknowledges this and has uh, contributed significantly to support the United Nations assistance mission to Iraq to provide the kind of support that the Electoral Commission needs. Um, so we're working on it. At least there is a date that has been set. There is a measure of realism in the way the Iraqi government and Iraqi authorities have been uh, following up on this. If you'll recall, uh, the first date that was suggested for the elections 
was sometime in June. And so uh, very seldom have I seen, you know, the Iraqi authorities say, oh, sorry, we can't do it on time. We'll, we'll try to delay this. Uh, in fact, the last time I, I, I can think of this, we, the first elections that were implemented in Iraq, uh, uh, some people argued uh, for a delay uh, to improve the electoral system to make it uh, um, better suited to the realities on the ground. Unfortunately, that, that, that didn't take place. But now I think with this additional delay of uh, several months, uh, I think we'll be in good shape to hold these elections as, as should be. And hopefully there'll be a, a, a good turnout. Mind you, there is a, there's a big difference is that the, the electoral system has changed. And so the, the, the selection process and the nature of the, of the candidates who will be elected or chosen is different. Hopefully they'll be closer and more responsive to, uh, to their electors. That's great. My, my next, my last question before I go to audience questions is this, uh, the, the uh, status of the economic and political reform that is going on in Iraq. Uh, the uh, Iraq has been helped a little bit recently with the rise of prices of, uh, of oil. <clears throat> and also uh, the, uh, uh, the some uh, better uh, improving uh, economic conditions, but also there have been uh, downsides and also negative perceptions and, uh, among the public opinion, uh, especially the question of the, um, uh, the, the uh, exchange, currency exchange and, and the price of the dollar uh, uh, compared to Iraqi dinar. There, there was a raise uh, that became unpopular. Um, heated debate was about it still, including passing of the budget was held um, on a couple of issues. One of them was the dollar question. And also it became more of a political uh, fight in addition to its uh, economic merit. Uh, so uh, where are we with implementing the white paper that uh, Professor Ali Alawi put uh, forward? Uh, and uh, where are we with, with realistically implementing some of these measures? Uh, especially with the concern by some people that rising of oil prices sometimes might give incentive to the government to spend and put some of these reforms aside because sometimes uh, reforms are always needed when there is a crunch. But once money comes in, you will see a tendency to uh, for, for spending, which is not just unique to Iraq everywhere. I think this is where, where the governments uh, uh, do. Uh, so, so where are we with Iraq or in Iraq with, with the economic reform and, and uh, the measures? And how is the government planning to uh, first insist on these measures that are unpopular and hopefully sell them to the Iraqi people, particularly those who are affected by it uh, in the immediate uh, uh, term? Oh, well, that, that's, um, you know, the, it's the job of the government to do that. Um, so um, the uh, what I what I give this government credit for is that they uh, you know uh, call a spade a spade. So they they realize the difficulties of the situation we're in. Uh, they're helped by the fact that they have a stellar uh, minister of finance who's uh, you know a, a joint friend and, and, and a remarkable individual. Uh, um, he uh, is highly regarded by the uh, international entities that are supporting us uh, in our financial and economic transition. And so um, uh, he's the best person for the job at the current time. Um, you, if you look at the, at the uh, economic situation of Iraq, uh, I mean, the, the government undertook a series of measures uh, that I think are all, the, first of all, a, 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 an updated, if you will, budget uh, that, uh, that took the realities of the situation more into account. Um, a uh, devaluation of the dinar um, that was, uh, you know, calibrated so that it can deliver, uh, you know, what it need, what's need, what needs to be delivered to the finances of the country without tax taxing the most destitute uh, too heavily, and also, you know, a white paper that uh, uh, called for a, a whole series of measures uh, that were geared towards energizing uh, the Iraqi economy and uh, empowering the private sector. 
And as you know, there's been quite a bit of progress on this. There, uh, uh, of course, you can you can drop whatever papers you want, unless you have an implementation plan. It won't be very helpful. And so the implementation plan has been developed. It's available for those of you who want to see it. Uh, and I, I think uh, what, what I what I what I draw quite a bit of uh, satisfaction from is I, I feel a real a real sense of strong commitment uh, to these to these reforms that the Iraqi government is is trying to implement. I um, mean, we uh, bear bear in mind that its main objective now is to find uh, jobs for all these young people who are entering the, the job market. We get about a million a year, um, and the state can't do that. Uh, actually, the state shouldn't shouldn't be doing that. And in fact, I, I'd like to remind you that uh, in, in this case, oil has really been a scourge to us. Prior to 1958, uh, all the oil revenues, whatever little there was, thanks to the oil companies, um, they uh, was was devoted to future projects uh, in a model that was later followed by uh, Norway to develop its own. Uh, 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 oil industry, but the budget of the state was derived from taxes on agricultural imports uh, and sorry exports. Uh, so why not try to reproduce this? I mean, the, we we have plenty of arable land, and uh, we uh, are trying to become you know self sufficient. Last year, fortunately, we had a, a glimpse of what could happen because of that. We had a good water year, and so there was a surplus of wheat and rice. Uh, not sure about rice, but certainly of wheat, uh, to the degree that they had to, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, set up uh, uh, emergency silos to store the to store the uh, the uh, the wheat that they that they found that that was uh, I mean that that was produced. Um, so um, uh, all I can say is that you know we have a plan. We have to implement it. Uh, there is seriousness of person, pur purpose in the Iraqi government. And honestly, in order for us to be able to implement it, we won't be do able to do it alone. We need the cooperation, not only of, uh, of, of um, you know, the United States, uh, so I'm talking to uh, an American audience, essentially, but also uh, our, our neighbors. And I think in this regard, the opening up of Iraq to our uh, Arab neighborhood, I think is very, very welcome in that it, it can open markets for us. It can provide us with, with investment uh, that will be value adding and job creating. Great, uh, let me ask you a question from uh, Ambassador David Mack. Uh, hey. uh, he asks uh, a, an interesting question. Should the United States government provide financial assistance to Iraq to facilitate projects by U.S. firms to reduce flaring of gas. Oh, absolutely. In fact, if you're committed to fighting climate change, that's the first thing you should do. But in fact, uh, these are uh, projects that in themselves are commercially viable. And so whatever uh, you know, loans that would be provided to uh, initiate such projects, I think uh, very, very quickly, you'll find enough return on investment to reimburse whoever uh, provided you the initial funds. Thank you, uh, I agree. Uh, the a question from uh, Raymond George uh, says, despite the fact uh, USA has been in Iraq since 2003, its involvement in rebuilding Iraqi infrastructure, economy, industry, and agriculture has been proportionately low. Why and when this will change to attract more American enterprises to be in Iraq? That is actually one of the things where we have, you know, dropped the ball. We have not done uh, what we need to do in order to be able to uh, provide incentives uh, to American businessmen to achieve that. Uh, uh, what I'd like, and what 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 my embassy has been trying to get it, get started with, uh, is to try to reach out to uh, specific communities in the United States, business communities that would be uh, more. Uh, uh, inclined to work with Iraq uh, than others. I'm thinking in particular of the uh, Iraqi expatriate community. I can give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, we received a, a delegate from very influential businessmen in the D Detroit area who wanted to help in the rebuilding of their liberated areas of their ancestral homes. And so uh, if you think that uh, uh, in, for example, in the state of Michigan, the um, 
Association of Chaldean American Businessmen. I'm, I'm not sure if, the name, if I'm getting, getting the name right, but the businesses they own generate $10 billion worth of business. That These aren't small players. These are people who can make a, a huge difference in Iraq. Another community that I'd like to reach out to, and in fact, I'm in the process of drafting a letter to the uh, uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs on this, is to try to reach out to American veterans, people who have served in Iraq, people who have a stake in the success of Iraq. And here, the model I have in mind is uh, Vietnam. I remember visiting the office of uh, Senator um, uh, McCain, who showed me a picture of him, you know, bobbing on a pond, and he was surrounded by American, by by Vietnamese soldiers, and the picture given to him uh, was given to him by the Vietnamese Minister of Defense, and. Uh, if you look at the economic exchanges between the United States and Vietnam right now, they're absolutely stellar. There's no reason why we couldn't uh, emulate that. All right, uh, I have a few great questions. I mean, all of the questions are really wonderful, so it's hard to choose. Let me uh, pick a, a shift to security and talk uh, about, uh, well, the questions from, from uh, Ina Rudolph. Uh, how do you see uh, the threats uh, voiced by multiple resistance factions affecting the spirit of the strategic dialogue? Uh, to which extent can we expect that the uh, potential renewal of the uh, re of a revisited version of the JCPOA could appease or these groups or uh, make their, their or alter their their, their behavior? Well, we're we're, we're hoping we're, we're hoping that it that it will. You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> let's let's call this Iran is our neighbor, and the United States is our friend, and we're caught in the middle, and so we would we do not want to be involved in any axis of one party against the other. We want to have good relations with with all our partners, with all our, with all our neighbors. Uh, and I will remind you that, you know, from 2014 to 2018, of course, American troops had left in 2000 at the end of 2011. But in 2014, from 2000, end of 2014 to 2018, um, American soldiers and um, you know people who were sympathetic to Iran, Iraqis though, um, uh, I, I don't think that there was a single incident uh, that could be uh, pointed to. Um, uh, we're hopeful that uh, you know the uh, uh, that the general environment and tension in the area will abate once uh, you know, negotiations uh, bring uh, a desired outcome. Uh, I will remind you that uh, in Iraq, we, were, uh, we have always been in favor of uh, something like the JCPOA, for example. Uh, if you recall, in 2012, one of the rounds of the negotiations that led to it was held in Baghdad. Uh let me uh, ask another question from uh, Randa Slim, our uh, colleague uh, at the uh, Middle East Institute. Um, uh, Randa's question uh, is regarding the human rights uh, report that the US just issued. And uh, the question was, was that, uh, was that country report discussed at this session uh, of the strategic dialogue? If so, what should we expect from the committees established by the Iraqi government uh, uh, on investigations of uh, human rights violations in the country? Well, I, I can tell you that the Iraqi government is committed to following up on these on these on these investigations. That was one of the first promises of the uh, of the uh, of the new government when they came uh, into power. It's actually one of the things that has been uh, mentioned and discussed during during the. Uh, 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 the, uh, the the strategic dialogue. Uh, there's that, and there is a you know a, 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 an explicit sentence about the, uh, increasing uh, judicial cooperation between Iraq and the United States, as well as to uh, address another issue which uh, is important to the Iraqi public, which is the prosecution of corruption and, and corrupt officials. That. Now, uh, Mr. Andrew Snow is asking a question that is well within your uh, uh, most favorite interests and, and, and previous activities. Uh, it says, Ambassador, what can you tell us about the discussion you mentioned on climate and specifically about reducing the flaring of gas? 
Well, um, so uh, how much time do I have on this? Well, uh, <laughs> no. uh, we, we have some time. But, yeah. So you know, uh, it's, yeah, my, please. I know this is a lot. My, my so friend, my, my my friend Faisal Stravati uh, reminded the, us at some lecture uh, that the, our first meeting with with Ambassador Ryan Crocker in Baghdad that was in, in June two thousand four. I complained about the fact that we were uh, not using the flared gas to uh, to produce electricity. So that's what um, you know, uh, seventeen years ago, eighteen years ago. Um, and the fact is that every year we're burning the equivalent of two billion dollars worth of of gas. That's uh, not only uh, economically unwise, it is environmentally crazy. And if you uh, look and live in the vicinity of you know these uh, production sites, I mean you, it's it's living hell. So uh, there is nothing but incentive to uh, to do that. Now the problem with with Iraq and and flared gas is that we missed out on on this uh, in a number of rounds. So the first round of when countries started taking advantage of their flared gas to produce electricity. I think uh, the area was done by the Saudis uh, who had a company, Aramco, that was run uh, according to basic business principles. And they realized that, uh, well, you know, instead of burning this gas, we could use it to produce electricity and therefore we could export more oil. Um, trouble with this, that Iraq was, uh, I, I think, run by, uh, you know, a, a socialist model, but, Bottom line didn't really uh, count as much as uh, as for a, a for-profit company, and so we missed out on the initial phase. The second phase happened in the 1990s, where countries uh, who joined the climate change uh, convention uh, benefited from mechanisms to uh, such as the clean development mechanism and others to uh, capture their flared gas and 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 turn it into into energy. Uh, Algeria did something like that, but unfortunately, Iraq joined the convention only in 2009. Um, we're trying to catch up, uh, play catch up. I think there was an effort to do this already in 2009 when we had the first round of bid, uh, bid rounds for the exploration of Iraqi oil. And uh, certain companies were charged with collecting the flared gas from other companies to produce electricity. But um, uh, the enforcement mechanisms weren't, weren't, weren't all in place and we weren't able to achieve what we wanted. But now there is a real incentive to do this. There is a will uh, and um, and we are going to proceed with it. I mean, like I said, it's $2 billion a year and that's not no laughing matter uh, for any country. I agree. Um, we have a couple of minutes left and I have, or actually we are about out of time, but I, this is a question that I don't want to pass on. That's from Marta. Uh, she says, the, uh, His Excellency mentioned that the sensitive issue of water preservation in Iraq. Would it be possible to touch on Iraq's policies and strategies in addressing water management and what projects, more specifically, the Iraqi government would expect uh, to see uh, foreign investors' involvement in? And also, I might add to the question, what can the U.S. do uh, in that this highly sensitive, high, I mean, it's life or, or death question for Iraq when it comes to their water portion, given what the, what the climate is and what the summers look like and also the agriculture. So that would be our concluding question and we would really appreciate your take on that, Mr. Ambassador. Well, uh, you know, there's a blessing in having rivers, uh, um, but we're a downstream country. So we're sitting under, uh, you know, the control of our upstream neighbors. Um, are, there are international agreements that govern uh, this. There's a, a, a convention on the non-navigational use of, uh, of waterways, which we're trying to promote. We've adhered to it, looks at these things uh, and takes into account the, uh, the, the rights of downstream countries. This is a big issue. I mean, look at what's happening between, um, you know, Egypt and Ethiopia and, and, and the Sudan. That's, uh, water is the lifeblood. So uh, we are, uh, and the, the, the real problem is that for the, during the entire 1980s and 90s, uh, the Iraqi uh, government was completely absent, uh, even in our negotiations with, for example, the, uh, the Turks, uh, we, uh, like Syria, are downstream countries. 
but because of the political differences between the two regimes, uh, they never managed to get themselves uh, a, you know, a joint position to, to bargain or, or to argue from. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the situation is. There are models where uh, things have been uh, uh, mitigated. For example, uh, the Mekong Delta has a, an authority, an international authority that caters to the needs of the, uh, of the downstream countries and protect and defends their rights. Um, maybe some sort of regional arrangement would, would be helpful. Uh, but there's another component to that. Um, I mean, the, the sort of it's a rated question is how much water you get, how much water you use. And we're not very good on, on, on we're, we're being constrained on, on the, on the uh, uh, not only the uh, quantity of water we're getting, but also on the quality of water we getting it's it's getting to be very saline um, even actually from uh, the southern uh, outlets uh, water salt water is, is seeping into the shelter Arab turning it into some sort of uh, you know estuary uh, but uh, where we could benefit from uh, you know US enterprises is how to use water uh, carefully uh, in arid environments um, you know, our, uh, our use of, uh, of water is intensive in agriculture. I think uh, we could do a lot better by uh, learning from uh, what American companies do. I remember a recent visit to, you know, uh, Senator Bozeman, uh, who mentioned that in his state, uh, companies have managed to develop ways of producing rice that are not very water incentive intensive. And so that may be one way where we could uh, further our cooperation to uh, with, with the United States. The uh, sorry, well, the, there's actually another another way of doing that, is that if we 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 need to get a, a better picture of what we have, what the situation of the water is, what the composition of the water is, of pollution, and so I think. Uh, the entities that the United States has, um, NOAA is the one entity I mentioned, but other other institutions can be extremely helpful in, in getting us to the desired level of, of knowledge. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your generosity with uh, taking all of the questions and also uh, the, the candidness that you are uh, always uh, uh, answering these questions and 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 you are uh, and talking to us and and uh, elsewhere when whenever you are asked uh, your your candidness is always appreciated uh we thank the the audience also who joined us from various parts of the world and also the uh, our team here at the atlantic council uh and uh, too many to name and i don't want to miss anyone and also the embassy uh, for for their uh, cooperation and making this happen. Uh, it's always an honor and privilege to speak with you and to host you. And we look forward to continued cooperation and working with you. Um, it's uh, It's been a wonderful journey uh, since uh, we, we started working together through the Iraq Initiative and, and the embassy. Your support is always great. And as I said, your, your candidness and, and your work in, on behalf of Iraq and also for the, uh, the relations between Iraq and the United States, uh, which are very important for both countries. We thank you and we appreciate your work and service and wish you a very wonderful week. Well, if I may, I was uh, reflecting that uh, my, my first involvement in political issues happened more than 30 years ago when with uh, four other friends, we went to the uh, State Department uh, based on a fax that I had written with Kanan McKee and had uh, him and uh, Mohammed Hakim sign. We faxed it to um, Alan Misenheimer, who was the Iraq desk officer. And we met with uh, John Kelly, uh, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for ne Near Eastern Affairs. And our uh, pitch to the United States at the time was please get rid of Saddam. You know, he will uh, do terrible things. You have defeated him militarily. He was in the process of uh, crushing a, a uh, you know, popular rebellion. And I shouldn't talk too much about this because you were right in the middle of it. And I, you know, want Thank you, you. To, to say more about that. And uh, you saw the terrible things that he did. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've, 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 been, <laughs> I've been involved in this for quite a while. 
And I am e eager to uh, see the kind of cooperation and, and, and engagement of the United States that is uh, positive for, for all concerned, uh, education, exchanges, commerce. Um, I've benefited from an American education. Even when I was in, in Baghdad, I went to a school that was founded by American Jesuits. Um, uh, and if any are listening, I would like to salute them. And so uh, I would only like to close by emphasizing the fact that we need further engagement, which uh, can only be served by reopening the uh, American consulate in Basra. And if I could just, I wanna show you this picture where you see uh, this guy here, uh, Lindbergh, um, I think it comes up clearly on the picture, having his passport stamped by an Iraqi official with the with the you know dark hat, and this gentleman here is undoubtedly a representative of the American consulate in Basra. Uh, come to the, welcome that uh, you know American hero. So my pitch is that I hope that for the next uh, um, strategic dialogue, we'll have uh, an Iraqi consulate in in Houston and an American consulate open in Basra. Thank you. I'm into that. And, Thank and, you very much. And, and wait, 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 wait. And yes. I really want to want to acknowledge the the contributions of the of the Atlantic Council uh, to the to Iraq, but also to many many other issues. Um, uh, I think you have an initiative on resilience that I think we could um, very greatly benefit from, uh, even on issues that have to do with the transition from conflict to post conflict situations. The Atlantic Council has great expertise with countries of Latin America that have gone through this way before us, where we could uh, probably learn from them quite a bit. Thank you. Uh, and these are very important uh, final remarks. We appreciate that you, you mentioned them. We certainly stand with you on, on uh, supporting the idea of more engagement, more cooperation, and more support. Uh, and uh, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, Wish you all a healthy, uh, prosperous time, and also uh, for our Muslim friends and in the audience and beyond, uh, uh, happy Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. Thank um, you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, John. Thanks. Right. Okay. Bye bye.